In case you can't tell, today we are at the Anoka County Fairgrounds and it's a little bit windy. And you guessed it, today we're gonna learn all about county fairs on this episode and their historical significance. So sit back, grab a pronto pup and get ready as we learn about the history of county fairs on this episode of It's Your History. To start the show, the Anoka County Historical Society's Executive Director, Rebecca Ebnett Mavencamp, is going to give us a history on county fairs. It's brand new at the fair this year. There's nothing else like it at the fair. Do you look forward to that corn dog or pork chop on a stick every summer as you wander vendor booths and animal barns listening to the drone of the demo derby at the grandstand? Without even saying it, you knew I was referencing fair season across the country, and more specifically, July, when Anoka County Fairgrounds come to life for one very special week. The fair has deep roots in ancient history. Merchants gathered in marketplaces, travelers sold wares from distant lands brought by camels or horses, and through time these markets became places to show off new inventions and all of the newest technology. It appears that the first fair in the Americas was held in Nova Scotia in 1765. Soon the Niagara Agricultural Society held a fair in Ontario in 1792. The idea came south, and by 1811, Alcana Watson, a New England patriot and farmer, organized the Berkshire Agricultural Society and created an event known then as the Cattle Show in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Watson expanded the idea of exhibition to include a competition, with prize money paid for the best oxen, cattle, swine, and sheep. Within eight years, most New England counties had organized their own agricultural societies and held gatherings of some form. As the population spread west, so did the traditions of showing off the best of the best, sharing trade secrets, and reconnecting with neighbors. Anoka County, formed in 1857, created an agricultural society in Anoka at the beginning of the Civil War. A temporary building was erected on Third Avenue and members filled it with produce, dairy products, and articles of merchandise. First prize horses, cattle, and sheep earned the farmer $3, though winning entries of swine, poultry, grains, vegetables, fruit, and baked goods received a paper certificate. Society members paid 50 cents in support of the organization, which earned them the right to enter goods in other categories, such as best paneled doors, best made keg, best steel engraving, rag carpet, woolen stockings, or even the best brass band. When life returned to a new normal after the war, the Agricultural Society reformed in April of 1873. This did not provide funds for setting up the grounds of the fair, so the fair was held at the town hall in Anoka. Four years later, the fair was held at McCann's Driving Park, just northwest of the city of Anoka. These grounds were leased for five years. In 1880, the Society issued 100 life memberships at $5 each. This helped raise funds to purchase the grounds, comprising 17 acres lying almost completely within Anoka city limits. Interestingly enough, until the 1890s, the emphasis of the fairs had been mainly on horse racing. But as the turn of the century approached, cash prizes for the best township displays of grains, vegetables, and dairy products were awarded for the first time. Not to be outdone, the merchants of Anoka decided to create the Anoka Street Fair Association, opening their own market in 1899 along Main Street. This gathering featured ball games, shows, a parade, masquerade ball, livestock, and farm displays, as well as a balloon ascension, a wedding, and a carnival in a queen pageant. Both organizations held their annual events until 1912, at which time businessmen agreed to hold a joint venture and guaranteed a fund for larger prize payments. 
like $25 for the best 50 bushel load of potatoes. At the end of World War I, the Anoka Union ran a lengthy article about the competitions in livestock, poultry, and vegetable categories. They noted it was the 8th annual Anoka County Fair, and as a county institution, asked for the support from every citizen with the exception of 1946, when a polio outbreak closed down the fair. Residents have had the opportunity to celebrate their agricultural heritage every year. The Anoka County Historical Society has had heritage displays there since 1958, and this year will be no exception. So we'll see you at the old farmhouse the last week in July. Perhaps a far richer history than any of us even realized. Well, after the break, we're gonna hear from some of the board of directors for the Anoka County Fair, coming up next on It's Your History. In this next segment, Rebecca gets the opportunity to speak with Tammy Fossum, Bob Fossum, and Ray Hyvolti from the Anoka County Board of Directors. Well, we're here today with uh, Ray Hyvolti and Bob Fossum, uh, two of the Board of Directors of the Anoka County Fair, and they're going to give us some perspective over their experience, uh, which I understand has uh, a zero or two behind it, right? It has. Yeah. yeah. Um, when did you first get involved with the fair? Oh, uh, about 30 years ago is when just, I think it's right around 30 years. Yeah. And I think Ray is the same way. Yeah. 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 So. And did you begin as uh, on the board of directors or were you volunteers at first? No, I, <laughs> mine goes back a little further than that. Uh, I started in the mid 70s um, as a, um, I was with the sheriff's office as, as one of their, the chief reserve officer for the you Anoka know, County Sheriff Rangers. Okay. And so uh, I was working with security for the fair for many, many years and I really enjoyed it. And so I, uh, I ran for the board and fortunately I was elected and I guess I've been there ever since. <laughs> Don't let you leave, huh? I, I haven't left since <laughs> the mid 70s, so yeah. How about you, Ray? I started with just volunteering. It was probably closer to the late 70s or early 80s. I was involved with the animals a lot. And we used to bring dairy animals. We've brought sheep and swine in. My son is still involved with it. He's superintendent of all that right now. And then I got on the board about the same time as Bob. And then I think it was four years later, I was president for nine years. And then I've become the fair manager ever since. Okay. So you've seen a lot of changes oh, in the yes. fair over the years. Oh yes, a lot of changes. Years. Lots of changes. Can you tell yeah. me a few of them? The, the buildings, we've, we've over the years, we've added so many new buildings, replaced buildings, had blacktop replaced, fenced areas, and we have really, made a big improvement that way. Okay. Just recently we had, uh, we built a new barn because the other barn was uh, pretty dangerous. It was ready to collapse actually, is what we found out. And so we had to take it down. Uh, we had some engineers look at it and they said it wasn't safe. So we took it down, we put up a new building and then we put up the horticulture building. We took that down too, because that was one wall was ready to collapse on that. And that building was kind of unique that it was all brick and the bricks were made with uh, clay from clay from Anoka from County. In, a, in Anoka County. They were all, and we still have some of those bricks Wonderful. save for, uh, you know, memorabilia, if you want to call it that. So, That's what we like to hear. Yeah, so we're, we've saved those. And we moved the church, uh, a ch the church, the Free Constance Church got moved in there in what year? Uh, 1980, 88 or 89. Yeah, and that was uh, that was up in Constance, uh, which is now Andover, sure. and it was uh, built in the 1800s, 
and now it was moved to the fairgrounds and it's still there. So, and that's part of and, Heritage Park, correct? Mm -hmm. Right. And the jail was moved from now then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a old cinder block jail and it was the real jail. It's a one person jail. <laughs> and that was moved from now then, yeah. So. And that's some of the, the fun things that the kids get to experience, right? That's right. <laughs> Yeah, they get a lot of pictures with the kids at jail. <laughs> <laughs> the best thing for the parents. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so. What about the atmosphere of the fair? How have you seen that change? Uh, it's, I think it's with the economy, things kind of went down for a while. It's coming back now. Uh, the attendance wise has went down over them years when the economy was so bad, but it's, slowly coming back now. Last year we had about 35,000 that came to the fair during the uh, during the run of the fair. <clears throat> and we see a lot of families now. The the families are changed a little bit, the, the kind of the suburban type mm -hmm. that are coming to the fair. A lot of these kids, as we we're talking, that they've never seen or touched a cow or seen an animal only in pictures. And we have, we have an artificial cow mm -hmm. That it's called Danny, and it's a, it's a, it's a full-size cow, <clears throat> and you can actually milk it, and it's quite an attraction getter for the kids, and it actually talks, and uh, we paid about nine thousand dollars out in Las just Vegas let, yeah. at the convention. And other fairs use this cow now as a demonstration purpose for uh, agricultural. Okay. And so they, we've, Danny travels all over the, all over the state here with, uh, so the kids can milk a cow. <laughs> so. so part of the fair, the mission is truly education from yes. the agriculture A lot of standpoint. it is, very much so. I so appreciate your time on the show today and, and you're giving us your opinions of the fair. So thank you right. so much for your hard work. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for inviting us. <laughs> We're joined today by the father-daughter team at the fair of Bob and Tammy Fossum. And uh, Tammy, you've been telling me that uh, you were pretty much just born right into the uh, endeavor. Yeah, I've been going to the fair with my dad and the sheriff's, and I thought it was so cool riding in in the sheriff's vehicles, you know, into the fair, just thinking I was so cool. <laughs> So ever since my brother and I were very little, we got to run around like crazy kids we thought we were. What were some of the best memories you have of those years? I actually, some of my more fond memories were my first years working the fair. I was 16 years old and worked in the little red schoolhouse where we had the juniors arts and crafts division. And the most favorite thing was leaning out the windows at the lumberjacks, drooling, <laughs> thinking I was in love. <laughs> Did that work out for you? Know that. <laughs> um, yeah, no, <laughs> not so much, but it was fun. <laughs> Did you have friends that were just fair friends? No, um, I would say fair family. Okay. More than friends, you know, dad and yeah. and Ray and and raise children and all the other fair board directors, their children, we kind of watching each other grow up or, I'm a little older than some of them, but we're all kind of the same age group, so. And you've been volunteering for over 30 years and uh, so those those ties run deep, yep. I understand. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. And right now you said you're redoing the website? We are, we're in the process of redoing the website to be released in a couple weeks. So we're excited about that, um, showing you know the progress of just uh, technology, you know, and how important it is from a business perspective. Sure. Mm -hmm. So that's part of moving the fair forward is the, the communications. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're we're leaning a lot more to the social media. This is where the younger people come in and. They fit right into that program so sure. well, you know, that uh, the old way of the newspapers and everything else has completely changed, obviously. Yeah. You know, social media is the way now, and yeah. this is what she's specializing in, so. Well, we truly thank you for your commitment to it. I know it began in the 1800s, and it's going strong still, and yep. uh, volunteers like you are the only reason that it's it's happening. So. 
to all the people that are involved in the fair. We'd really like to extend a thank you. We enjoy it. Well, wonderful. Thank you again for coming on the show and, and showing us a little bit more about the fair and, and your experiences. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Thank you. It's always great to hear from the people who run the show behind the scenes. After the break, we're going to hear all about the importance of 4-H to the history of county fairs. Coming up next on It's Your History. Hello, I'm Winter Kuharski, inviting you to watch The Local Show on QCTV, where we'll meet some great organizations and people that go above and beyond to serve your communities. If you have a story of hope, generosity, or want to share a story of inspiration to chase dreams, share it with us at QCTV. We'd love to share your story with the rest of the community, and your story could be featured on The Local Show. In this next segment, we're going to learn all about the importance that 4-H has had for the history of county fairs. And we're going to hear about that from a 4-H student participant as well as the Anoka County Program Coordinator. I have always done rabbits. Like, it's been going on my entire life with my entire family. My dad actually did them when he was m about my age. so. It's been a part of my life. My name is Jordan Paulus. I'm a senior at St. Francis High School. I've been in 4-H for 13 years now. I've been in 4-H since kindergarten, so my entire life. It's nice to really just take the time and spend some time away from everything and just be there with an animal. It really helps your day make it better, if you would say. It's really taught me a lot about re leadership and Getting out of my comfort zone, it's taught me to be there for myself and for other people. So really, I get to work with a community and I get to help the community, but I also get to help myself in teaching myself pretty much life lessons about just getting up and doing things that you might not want to do, but then you end up enjoying it. It's really just a good experience to get out there and learn new things and make the best better. So 4-H, around the, the beginning of the 20th century, there were, um, the 4-H clubs started, um, but it was, really it was, um, the land-grant universities were trying to teach good agricultural practices to adults and make some changes, but what they found is that they had more success working with the youth. So they were bringing in kids, so they started working with kids and that was helping, that would help make a change in agriculture practices. They started corn clubs, so that was kind of the first thing, corn clubs, and um, eventually they started with girls with baking and canning. So as part of that movement, they had contests or showcases or exhibitions, and that was typically at a county fair or in a fair-like setting. So those exhibitions were kind of showing off the innovation that the kids were um, coming up with and um, also as a time for celebration. So 4-H has a long history with being a part of the fairs, kind of from the very beginning. It was really that, that showcase piece for them, a place where people can come together and they could share the, the findings that these, these kids had with their corn clubs and the baking and the canning. A big historical change is just social media and the internet with fairs. You know, we have our youth members are posting things on Facebook and they're, you know, Instagramming and they're tweeting, oh, we're out at the fair. And it's like, you go home from the fair at night, but you go on the internet and it's still continuing because you're seeing what's happening there. And there's this great social dialogue that happens. I mean, that's, I mean, nobody could have foreseen even maybe 15 years ago that that would kind of be the world that we're living in. But that's the, that's the world these kids live in. They take a picture of their exhibit and then they post it on Facebook and then pretty soon their family and friends from around the country are seeing what kids in Anoka County are doing and so that's kind of a, a cool thing that's happened with fairs too. It's a partnership when you're out at the fair between the fair board and um, the historical societies there. There's all these different players that kind of come to create this really cool environment that pops up for a week out of the year and then um, it goes away and people wait for it all year long but that 4-H has really always been kind of that, one of those cornerstone pieces of the fair experience. We have a lot of rabbits, so I like having a big scoop to easily scoop the food into the rabbit. And since 
We have little baby bunnies. We usually go through more food. So you just, just makes life easier. And we're planning to expand so we can have more bunnies out that way, which is where my show chickens are. But yeah, usually when I'm taking care of them, I do food first and then I'll water. It's kind of just my system. It's nice to have a system. And then like, I'll go through rabbits, then I'll go through chickens. The best part is being a youth leader because I get to teach kids and be an inspiration to them. And that really inspires me to be better so they can be better. And I just love it so much. 4-H is just making the best better and you want to show off what you can do and you want to show what the community can do together because we work together as a community at as 4-H at the county fair to make the county fair fun for everyone because we want the community to be inspired to do better things so yeah. The 4-H of today offers far more opportunities than it ever did in my day and it's great to see what they're up to. Coming up next on the show we are going to hear from a husband and wife team who have studied the cultural significance of county fairs all across America. All that coming up next on It's Your History. Hi, I'm Catherine in Bergen, Norway, and you're watching QCTV. Next up on the show, a husband and wife team of co-authors have written a book about county fairs all over America. And in this segment, they're going to tell us a little bit about their historical significance. Actually, the idea came to us when we were taking a long hike, actually overseas, a 10-day hike, and we thought, um, we were talking about what we missed about America. And we'd been out of the country for a while, and it really occurred to us, you know, that's a time to compare. What's our life now like now compared to before? And we started talking about the county fair. And when we did that, we thought, you know, there's not a good book about the county fair. And after a couple of days of walking and talking, we finally said, we should do a book about the county fair. And so once we got back in the country, we began. The first modern county fair, like we would recognize them today, the first fair along the American plan was in 1811 and it was a small event in Pittsfield, Massachusetts and drew a handful of local farmers and their livestock and so forth. And that grew into an institution, a tradition that we've, we, we still carry on today in remarkably unchanged ways despite the fact that there's been 200 years of people from people who were once very much agriculturally based and uh, uh, subsistence agriculture to now when, what is it, fewer than 2% of Americans are involved in, in the production of food. It's something on that order. It's a very small number. But the county fair remains. It's this remarkably enduring traditional uh, uh, endeavor, traditional event. Perhaps more traditional, more tied to the American tradition than any other event we have, except maybe 4th of July. Sometimes we'd go to a fair and it would surprise us. Maybe it was a fair that was quite rural or quite urban and we'd, we had our ideas about how what we'd want to investigate. But county fairs surprise you. <laughs> so we would get there and sometimes we'd spend maybe only four or five hours and the next one we'd spend four or five days. So we never knew what we'd find. We never knew we, who we'd meet. But it was all about meeting the people who make the fair. And we call those people fair makers. A fair has to have interesting food. That's what brings people to the fair. You better eat it now because you can't get it until next year, right? And you shouldn't probably in most cases. It's not always the best food for you, but we set that aside. We go to the county fair, the state fair as it were, and eat stuff on a stick and just because it's fun, right? That, that, that's, that's an important part of it. So uh, it, it, it's, 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 it's what we do. The other thing that I think is interesting is this notion to, in today's fair where uh, we do a lot of things at the fair that promote the county. 
that promote where we are. We bring the hospital helicopter if there is one. We bring a nice exhibit from the Historical Society. We bring lots of stuff that represents the county in its best way. And I think most fairgoers, if it's a good fair and if it's well run, they leave the fair at the end of the day or the end of the week and say, this is a pretty good place to live. We have a lot of good people here, many of whom I've just run into uh, and had a conversation with, and the businesses have brought things that they might be offering, uh, and the hospital is here with their, their newest technology, and uh, the sheriff is here handing out yardsticks. This is a good place to live. It's a way of celebrating what's best about, about our communities. But we also repeatedly wanted to investigate what was common to the fairs. What makes a county fair? And um, in our book, Purebred and Homegrown, uh, we looked at what are the elements of the fair. And so we'll talk a little bit about those. Um, the doing of the fair was really uh, interesting. It, it led to all sorts of um, stories from people who have made it really a big part of their lives and who want to encourage its propagation through history, that people don't want to lose it just like they don't want to lose other things for which they have real local pride. Minnesota, uh, uh, Georgia, or, or uh, Southern California, you get that same spirit at, at any fair you go to. Those two are some fascinating people who may well have just had one of the most fun assignments you could ever have. More coming up next on It's Your History. Thanks for watching QCTV. I'm Lisa Monsrud and I want to invite you to watch our local programs right here on QCTV. We do several monthly shows that you may find interesting. The Chamber Report is hosted by Pete Turok and it features local businesses from our area. You will be up to date with what is going on in our community, thanks to Pete. Also, the District Court Show is hosted by Judge Steve Halsey and it features judges and lawyers who talk about topics that affect us all. We also produce The Sheriff Show and Sheriff James Stewart and his staff keep us up to date on what is going on with the Sheriff's Department. News and Views is all about what is happening in our four city halls. You will meet the mayors, city council officials, as well as city employees telling us what we need to know. And the Public Safety Show informs us on what is happening at the fire and police departments in our community. So if you like local news, you will love QCTV. Again, thanks for watching QCTV. County fairs have always provided an excellent time for family and friends, but it's been very enlightening to hear all about their cultural significance as well. Thank you for joining us for this episode of It's Your History. For QCTV, I'm Matt Overstreet. <laughs>